Um, just uh, one quick announcement. Um, next week, I know this week we were supposed to have the walkthrough mass, uh, but I got a message from both David and Father Jose that said we are going to postpone it a week. So it'll be next week, uh, unless I get another message saying that we're postponing it again. <laughs> but if it is next week, my understanding is we won't meet here, we'll meet in the church. And he will walk through the Mass with us. It should take all two hours. Please come with your questions. If you ever wondered, why do we do this, Father? Why do you say that? What does that mean? What kind of, what do you say up there when you're this or that? You know, now is the time to ask. And I, I remember Bible study did this, oh, years ago when they brought the new translation of the Mass. And just before the new translation came out, we did several weeks on studying the Mass. <coughs> and it was in preparation for that new translation to get us more into what the Mass means, uh, what are the, the, the breakups of the Mass. Uh, you know, Mass is divided roughly into two parts. There's the, the liturgy of the Word, and then there's the liturgy of the sacrament. Um, and that's the rough division, and that's how it's been since the beginning of the church, uh, of how the Mass is divided. Um, and, and all the different component parts, in one form or another, have been there since the beginning. Um, as I mentioned last week, uh, and, I, and I found out, it was Eucharistic prayer number two has been around since at least the third century because that was composed, as we have record of, from St. Hippolytus. And we still pray that prayer after all these centuries. That's how old the Mass is. That's how uh, in, in steeped in tradition it is. Um, and it is the source of what we call the tradition of the church. We have the Bible, the Bible is the written tradition of the church, and the, as I mentioned last week, for most of you who weren't here, the one thing that's not in here that bothers Protestants, those of you who are here, do you know what it is? What's the one thing in the Bible that's missing that drives Protestants crazy? The order of how to conduct a church service. Just a church service, period. Not just the Mass, but just a church service. As a Protestant myself, as an evangelical, I remember the, the biggest controversy of the Bible-only movement. The, the, we believe in the Bible, we should do what it says. The one thing that it misses or lacks is how to conduct the church service. There is nothing in here that says, okay, now this is when the choir sings, this is when you take the offertory. There's nothing in here about it. And it bugs Protestants to no end. Why? Because we want to follow the Bible. We, the Bible's our only rule. The problem is there's nothing in here on how to conduct a church service. So whether you're a Baptist, or a Presbyterian, or an Episcopalian, or a Lutheran, you're basically making it up. They're all different. If you've ever been to a Lutheran service, a traditional Lutheran service, or an Episcopal service, or a Baptist service, or a Methodist service, they're different the way that it's ordered. Why? Because there's nothing in here that says this is what you should do. There's no order. And there's a good reason for that is because there's no need for it in the Bible. Because the original, the tradition of the church of how to celebrate the Eucharist was handed down in a non-written fashion. Could someone open the door, please? And so there was no need to write it down because everyone knew how it was conducted because it was given orally. So when we say the tradition of the church, the best way to find out what is that tradition is to look at the Mass, because that has come down to us 
since the time of the apostles, but it was never written because there was no need to. Well, then how do we know what to do? This is where we look into church history. And as I mentioned last week, if you look in the earliest church records, this was the big shock for me when I was coming into the church and studying. When I looked and read the church fathers, you know what I discovered? From some of the earliest records, it would say things like, be sure when you gather, the bishop is present, because where the bishop is, there is Christ. Boy, that's a big change. No one in an evangelical church would say, where the pastor is, there is Christ. The pastor is no different than you and I. But in the early church, they recognized there was a special grace that was given to those men who were the apostles and who later appointed men to follow them. And because of that, they acted in the place of Christ. Okay, so that was something. Second thing that you notice, and this comes very early in the church, are things like when you gather together, make sure that, that you have confessed all sin before you receive the Eucharist. And we know from the records of the early church, part what that meant was public confession. The bishop would be present before the, the mass began. People would come forward in front of the congregation and confess their sins. The bishop would then give absolution and penance Usually it was the other way around, I should say. They would impose a penance, and then the absolution would be given. Because there were some sins, like adultery, like murder, like apostasy, like um, Stealing. Uh, other high crimes like that. Uh, the bishop may impose a penance in which you had to beg outside of the church until Easter, before you were allowed in. That was the penance. So you did the penance first, then you got the absolution. Very interesting in the early church. These penances were also very heavy. They, they, they would be things like you had to beg alms and prayers of people outside the church until Easter. So can you imagine doing that? That's your penance. You couldn't come in and celebrate mass with everyone you could only observe it from outside until your penance was done. These were what were called canonical penances. They were heavily in, 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 uh, put upon those for grave uh, sins. It was later decided that these penances were so great that many people would not confess because they did not want to have such impenances imposed. So over the centuries, the imposition of penance was lessened to uh, invite more people in participation into the Eucharist. Very interesting. But the penances that were imposed by the early church are still part of what's called the treasury of indulgences that the church dispenses because they were so high and so holy that we are still reaping benefits from them. Very interesting back then. Also, wouldn't it be very embarrassing? Yes. And again, a lot of people were very self-conscious and would not do it. And so it was, I, I believe, at the time of St. Patrick that these public confessions were replaced with what we now call oral or, or auricular confession. auricular confession. And I believe this was around the time of St. Patrick. If I'm not mistaken, I believe it was St. Patrick that introduced this, this new way of doing penance, and it caught on to the rest of the church. Auricular means through the ears. Aural, A-R, means through the ear. It's 
what we now know as penance today. They would be a separate location. It was a private penance that only you and the priest heard, not everyone in the congregation. And then you say, well, if they, this was introduced, why'd they do it the other way before? Because if you look in the book of Acts, for example, Peter publicly addressed Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 about their sin. He publicly confronted them about their sin. And the Holy Spirit imposed the penance upon them for their lives. If you remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira, they lied to the Holy Spirit through Peter. And as a result, they both were killed. They both died right there on the spot. And it says a great fear came upon the church. In other words, we're not going to do that again. Okay. So this idea of public confession comes from that idea. Is this is what the apostles did in, in, in extolling penances and hearing confession. It was changed over the centuries to the, what we now know as auricular confession, which is what we experience today. It's private, not public, and it's what we call through the ear. Rather than a face-to-face -face public confrontation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so this is, I think penance is one of the most interesting sacraments that we have and how it's evolved over the centuries. If you see how it has come about, it's fascinating. It really is. It's extraordinary how the basic structure of confessing your sins has been there from the beginning, but how it is administered has changed over the centuries. You're still confessing your sins to the priest before you receive the Eucharist. But when and how it is administered has been different throughout the centuries. So anyway, um, I'm not sure how I got off on that, but that, <laughs> oh, we were talking about the mass. Well, that's, those are the things that you want to talk about to Father next week. Okay? Not about confession, about the mass, all right? But the, the point of all this is that this is how the early church celebrated it. And this is the source of our capital T tradition. We have scripture and what we call tradition with a capital T. This is not the kind of tradition like we do Advent wreaths or we pray the rosary. Those kinds of traditions within the church are, de are demarked with a lowercase t. Those are cultural and uh, period kinds of Tradition. traditions, I, I can't think of another word, that we have that can and would be altered through time. But the capital T tradition is something that came from Christ and the apostles themselves to us, like the sacraments like the mass and how to celebrate it okay those things are unalterable because they come from the same source of of revelation which is christ himself i would argue really there is only tradition there is written tradition which is scripture and there is what we would call oral tradition or non-written tradition and that would be primarily found in the mass and together, they work in tandem to tell us what the deposit of faith is that Christ gave us. What was all that Jesus revealed to us for our holiness and for our salvation? Both of those things are found in scripture and in tradition. And the way that they are presented or applied to us today the third element in this triad is what we call the magisterium. This is the living authority of the church. That is the Pope and the bishops in union with him, teaching authentically what was given to us by Christ and his apostles in and is deposited in both scripture and in tradition. You think of the church as a 2,000-year-old person. Someone who's been around for just one person, living for 2,000 years. 
who was there at the time when Jesus and the apostles were walking and talking and teaching on the earth. And if there was such a person, wouldn't you go to that person and say, you know, some people say that Jesus wasn't God. Is that true? And this person would pause and think, it's like, no, I remember Jesus talking about him being God all the time. Oh, well, then those persons are wrong. This person who was there, who heard and saw him, is right. This is St. Irenaeus' argument against the Gnostics of his day. He said all these teachers teaching all these things about Jesus know nothing about him. They're just spouting off their own two cents. I want to go to the men who knew the men of the apostles. I want to know the men who knew the apostles themselves. Those are the ones that can authentically tell us what Jesus said and did, not these fly-by-nights. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the argument that Irenaeus has for his day. Well, if you extend that, that's what the Pope and the bishops are to us today. They are representatives imbued by the Holy Spirit and guarded by the Holy Spirit to teach us authentically what Jesus said and did 2,000 years ago. So if there is a dispute within the church, it comes before the council. The Holy Spirit inspires them. And how do they do that? They go to the, the scripture and tradition and see what, how that relates to it. And as a result, they make decisions or pronouncement. This is what we call dogma. These are articles of faith that express what we should believe as coming authentically true from the apostles and prophets to us. That we need to know for our sanctity and our salvation. If we deviate from it, we are going off something that God has not said. That's the idea behind it. Am I making sense here? Everyone following what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, good. So this is how our faith, we know, is of God. is because it has remained unaltered since the time of Jesus to us today. That is not true of the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Episcopalians. Their theology, their morality has...